Oscar De La Hoya. Love him or hate him, there's no denying that he's one of the biggest stars to ever lace up the gloves. With a decorated amateur career that would be the foundation to a Hall of Fame body of work as a professional fighter, by the time he stopped fighting, Oscar had won 11 world titles in 6 weight classes, becoming the lineal champ in 3 weight classes along the way. Retiring with a record of 39 wins and 6 losses, Oscar fought everyone and anyone under the sun earning himself a Hall of Fame induction and many millions along the way. In fact, before Manny Pacquiao and Floyd Mayweather, Oscar was the highest earning boxer in history of the sport. Ultimately, his fighting record and accolades amount to a fighter who transcended his social status in sport, all while dealing with personal issues that would crumble many. So strap on in because today we take a look at the man who undeniably was the best of his generation and arguably the best to ever represent Mexican Americans in boxing. Oscar's journey begins in East LA, or East Lowe's as it's known colloquially. His grandfather, father, and brother had all fought professionally. Oscar was the next in line. Boxing would be instilled into Oscar thanks to his father Joel De La Hoya Sr. A tough love father if we want to put it nicely. It would be his father who would provide the drive and discipline for fighting. Meanwhile, his mother Cecilia de la Hoya would ensure Oscar got the love and attention he needed as a child. Not a perfect dynamic, but sufficient enough to form a rough diamond. Oscar's discipline would even pay off in his amateur career, the culmination of which came at the 1992 Barcelona Summer Olympics, winning the only gold medal in boxing for the United States in those Olympics, keeping his promise to his mother who had passed away two years prior. Oscar's amateur career would end on 234 wins and only 6 losses, with a 98% win ratio with an added bonus of 163 knockouts. His story of overcoming adversity in East Lowe's and the promise he had made to his mother made Oscar a household name. The winning of the gold medal would give Oscar his nickname we know today, the Golden Boy. Winning the gold medal would be the embers to a career that would engulf the entire sport. The Golden Boy would go on to become the face of boxing while conquering the sport and the world. His first title would come at 12-0 against Jimmy Bridell at the age of 20. This would be the start of a run that would see the Golden Boy go 31-0 before losing to Felix Trinidad, a fight that might be one of the later episodes on this channel. So if you'd like to see an episode on Oscar De La Hoya vs Felix Tito Trinidad, make sure to like and subscribe so you know when it drops. Now back to the story. So in only two years after turning pro, Oscar had gotten his first belt, in an era where interim champs were the rare exception. At this point in his career, Oscar was still being polished by his uncle and his father. Oscar was on the fast track to becoming a star in the sport. This is evident by his record alone. For example, in 1993, Oscar fought nine times, and in 1994, five times. Five of those fights had belts on the line. Fun fact, from here on out, Oscar's career would all involve some sort of belt on the line, either defending or challenging other than three fights, two of those fights being against Arturo Gatti and Manny Pacquiao. We would have to fast forward until June 7th of 1996 to get Oscar's most significant fight in a young and bright career against an all-time great of the sport, Julio Cesar Chavez. Along the way, Oscar had conquered two divisions devastating every opponent he had faced. But questions remained to be answered according to the talking heads and pundits. It was not enough to decimate every opponent he had faced. They wanted to see Oscar's chin and will be tested. Many argued that the golden boy was soft. The good looks, the great smile gave an appearance of a movie star more than a fighter. The golden boy thought that the best way to show he was tough was to fight the man who was the embodiment of tough. Perfect math by the golden boy. Well done. Now, at this time, Chavez was a nutshell of his former self, at best. I'm just being honest. 
based on how Chavez performed in his prime, but even an aging Chavez was a dangerous fighter. After all, Chavez is an unordinary fighter among unordinary fighters. Chavez, by the time he met Oscar in the ring, had already defended his various titles in three different weight classes 27 different times successfully. He also held and still holds the record for the most title fight victories and most wins against fighters in title fights standing at 31 for both. Oh wait, there's more. Chavez also holds the most title fights at 37 with 21 of those successful defenses won by knockout. Oh, and I should also mention that Chavez never had been stopped and also only lost once and had one draw, losing to Frankie Randall and coming to a draw with Pernell Whitaker, two undeniable talents to ever box. I mean, Pernell arguably was as talented, if not more talented than Floyd boxing. But hey, that's just my opinion. All of this with a record of 96, one and one, Chavez stepped in to fight Oscar as an aging lion. On fight night, Oscar showed up to earn the respect of his community. But the fight had created a divide within the Mexican and Mexican American community. Oscar was the Mexican American who at the time was not embraced by Mexican fans for being too much of a pretty boy. He was also everything a Mexican fan did not want in a fighter. Oscar was true to the cardinal rule of boxing of hit and don't get hit. Meanwhile, Chavez had superb technique but always was willing to take two for one. Many fetishized Chavez as some sort of grandiose slugger, but in reality he was a master technician with otherworldly conditioning. Oscar had previously sparred with Chavez when he was much younger. So fighting Chavez was less intimidating than usual. The fight would be defined by a cut over Chavez's eye that opened in the first round. Ultimately, it would create big problems for the legend's vision and the young lion capitalized on the moment. But like many of us when young, the golden boy had miscalculated his boxing math. Instead of being embraced by the Mexican community, Oscar had become a public enemy number one. If he was disliked before the fight, after beating Chavez, it was no understatement to say he was hated. Lots was left to be desired to fans around the world. Oscar had now won the fight that was largely determined by a cut. Now from here on out, I will focus on fights that will help tell the story that I want to tell of Oscar's boxing career. And by that I mean I have to skip over a lot of details of Oscar's life and career. For the sake of time and length, I have to skip certain events or fights to avoid making a three hour documentary. And I think that's without controversies and without including his promotional career. For example, before he fought Chavez, Oscar had beaten Jeff Mayweather, Jorge Paez, and John Molina. Now, not the biggest names, but when we move along his career, I will gloss over certain guys, not because they're less important, but because of time. Oscar and Chavez will not meet again until four years later. By this time, Chavez was more clearly on his way out of the sport, more so than the first fight. Meanwhile, Oscar had won fights over Hall of Fame fighters like Hector El Macho Camacho and Pernell Sweet P. Whitaker. Oscar would again defeat the aging legend again in eight rounds. Only this time, he decided to stay in front of Chavez and fight. But it was clear to everyone watching that Oscar would not be forgiven by many Mexican fans for what he did to their national hero. And the other thing that was obvious was that Oscar was the new face of boxing. Anytime the golden boy fought, the stars appeared. Oscar's popularity rose as quick as his boxing career. Being the gold medalist provided him with the launching pad to become a star like no other. He was a household name and having the charisma to match did not hurt his situation at all. After having had what he called the hardest fight in his career against Ike Corte, a very tough Ghanaian from the same gym as Azuma Nelson, Oscar would beat Ike and have one more fight before taking on Felix Tito Trinidad. Tito was the biggest boxing talent to ever come from Puerto Rico according to many in the island. And that's saying a lot since Puerto Rico at the moment regarded Wilfredo Gomez as their biggest hero. Tito had captured the imagination of the island and he was the coming of the new king. In my personal opinion, Gomez deserves a solid number one spot for the best ever to come from Puerto Rico, but Tito makes a solid best case to dethrone the king. Trinidad was son of Felix Trinidad Sr., who was also a pro fighter who fought the likes of Salvador Sanchez and Enrique Solis. Like Oscar, his dad had shaped Tito as a fighter and the duo had conquered the welterweight division together. It was evident that the fight was to be a super fight. Trinidad was to represent 
the challenge that Chavez was supposed to be if it wasn't for his age. Tito was in his prime. He was undefeated. He had real power in both hands. Oscar and Tito could also not be more opposites in many ways. Oscar was the golden boy who boxed and looked good while fighting. Tito was a warrior and hard puncher. Tito was also the one that was embraced by his country. Meanwhile, Oscar was hated by Mexicans for having beat up their national hero and preyed on the downfall of the golden boy. They saw in Tito what they wanted in Oscar. Tito was the country boy who was still humble, did not speak Spanish, and was a warrior before a boxer in the ring. But even with that baggage, Oscar was still supported by the majority of Mexican fans. Because nationalistic rivalries are bigger than any petty feuds that are going on within the community internally. In reality, it was just mental gymnastics by fans to support a man who clearly was proud of his heritage who was not embraced because he did not meet the arbitrary standard of being Mexican enough, a subject that is still alive and well today. Ryan Garcia, for example, faces a similar situation. Because you don't fit the mold of a traditional Mexican fighter, then you aren't worthy of being called Mexican, regardless of ethnicity of your parents or your heritage. And this leaves the fighter in a particular situation, where you're still called Latino by anyone in the States for being brown, but actual Latinos in Mexico and in the States think you're not Latino enough. You can be born in the States and be considered a Mexican fighter. Fernando Vargas and Mikey Garcia are good examples of such. Mexican Americans who are recognized primarily as Mexican fighters even though they are born and raised stateside. It was not enough for Oscar to be son of Mexican parents of a working class. To have been born in East LA where the population of Latinos makes 95% if not more of the population. Even speaking Spanish and creating a cancer center in East LA was not enough to be fully accepted by Mexican fans. So Oscar was not Mexican enough for the Mexicans, but also not American enough for the white people. But his skills and drive surpassed social issues and his talent rose to the top. Like Sugar Ray Leonard, he was a bona fide celebrity. He was a red carpet athlete who women would watch fights for. At the weigh-ins, they would go crazy. And just like Sugar Ray versus Tommy the Hitman Hearns, this was a super fight through and through to determine who was the biggest talent outside of the heavyweight division. It was again a storyline boxing fans loved so much. The puncher versus the boxer puncher. The golden boy versus the stoic warrior. The sellout versus one true to his roots. Add on this another layer that would turn this into a cultural event and pass the label of super fight. Just like Oscar had transcended the sport, this fight transcended the fighters. Meanwhile, an ancient rivalry between Mexico and Puerto Rico, as we have previously mentioned on this channel before, you are pressed to find another rivalry as passionate as this one. From Wilfredo Gomez versus Salvador Sanchez, Gomez versus Zarate, Gomez versus Pintor, Chavez versus Camacho, Oscar De La Hoya versus Felix Trinidad was now another chapter in that intense rivalry. For Tito, it was all on the line. To Puerto Rican fans, Oscar was the biggest star since Chavez and they wanted revenge from the destruction Chavez had caused in the 90s and 80s. If Tito won, this fight would put him right next to Wilfredo Gomez. The fight would end up being a mixed bag for the golden boy. Oscar would start the fight by completely outclassing the Puerto Rican fighter. For the first six rounds, Oscar looked levels above Trinidad. Oscar was putting on a boxing clinic by sticking and moving. He was throwing combinations and evading punches. It was one of the best six round performances, but as the fight went on, Oscar tired out due to the pace that was hard to keep. Trinidad never let up on the pressure on Oscar, and the constant moving away from danger had worn on the golden boy. Oscar, instead of sticking and moving, started just moving. He had beaten Tito so badly in the first six to nine rounds that they thought the fight was in the bag. So the last five rounds, Oscar decided to not continue what made him successful. He committed to what he called the biggest mistake of his life. Instead of closing the show, Oscar decided to cruise till the end, ultimately making the fight anticlimactic. The fight had all the ingredients to become one to be told for the ages, but the later half was far from legend and closer to controversy. The decisions by Oscar and his team would ultimately cost him the fight, at least according to Nevada judges. 
Oscar had lost in points regardless what he did in the first six rounds. To his critics, Oscar left a lot to be desired. He did not close the fight even though he was clearly the superior fighter that night. Oscar would outland Trinidad in the fight but the judges saw it the other way. Drama surfaced after the fight about meetings between managers, coaches, and referees. But none of that changes the facts that Oscar decided not to fight. In interviews, he often recounts that he and his corner felt that he did enough to win the fight. After the fight, Trinidad would become a legend on par with Wilfredo Gomez in Puerto Rico. And a loss against Puerto Rico did not help make new fans with Mexican ones already disliking him. After losing to Tito, the next super fight for Oscar was against Fernando El Feroz Vargas. But on route to Vargas, the golden boy had lost again, this time to Sugar Shane Mosley. It would later come to light that Mosley had tested positive for EPO prior to the De La Hoya fight. He would be snitched on by none else than the CEO of EPO, Victor Conti. If you want to know more on this scandal, check out our episode on Conti here. Oscar again was on the biggest stage fighting another fighter in his prime. The plot against Vargas was almost a carbon copy to the one against Trinidad. Only this time, it was Mexico versus Mexico. Why is he crying? I'm not gonna attack. Why are you crying for? Why are you crying? Why are your eyes watering? Why are you crying for? But within the Mexican community, it was a real Mexican versus one not Mexican enough. Vargas played the role of the people's champ and the favorite among the vast majority of Latin fans. The momentary support had turned into further resentment after the Trinidad fight having beaten Chavez years prior. Once again, being asked a question that for many critics had been answered in the Ike fight, where Oscar had to dig deep and close the show to get the win with his patent left hook. Mexican fans though were not convinced and they wanted blood for the Chavez fight. I said he didn't know the difference between um, one Mexican and the other one. Let me just tell you like this, how you can tell the difference. This one has fucking balls. On fight night, Chavez, an idol of Oscar, picked Vargas to win the fight and then doubled down by walking out with Vargas to the ring. You just can't get a better cold singer if you're Vargas. Golden Boy, though, had other plans in mind. What defined your image is what both fighters were looking to gain. Oscar wanted the nod as a tough Mexican fighter, and Vargas wanted all the glory and fame that comes with beating the Golden Boy. The fight would unfold as an absolute classic. Vargas would make the Golden Boy fight, pressuring until Oscar had to slow down. But same as he did with Ike, Oscar would resolve on the 11th round with a left that Oscar had perfected many times before. Bloody in days, Vargas now had to eat his words, and the critics had no choice but to accept that Oscar had beaten their man. To add insult to injury, Vargas would test positive for PEDs. Is that all you have? Is that all you have? Oh. Is that all you have? Hey, he, he couldn't even wrinkle my tie. Oscar would go on to make easy work of Yori Boy Campas, to then losing against a close fight to Shane Mosley a second time. This time, Mosley was clean, but he would quickly bounce back by challenging the middleweight champ, Felix Sturm. Moving up in weight and beating Sturm would set up Oscar for another opportunity to conquer a weight division. This time, it would be against the legendary Bernard Hopkins, the only man to beat Father Time. Oscar would be stopped via body shot for the first time in his career. Bernard had done what no other man had done before. He stopped the Golden Boy. In this occasion, Oscar was the smaller fighter moving up in weight. The perfect punch from Hopkins was the perfect punch to stop a man determined to win. A punch that often is described as paralyzing if placed correctly, delivered by the executor himself. It had been two years almost to date since the Vargas fight the night he fought Hopkins, and five years since the Trinidad fight. Along the way, Oscar was no saint out of the ring. He had lived the fast life with no speed limit. His celebrity status had granted him opportunities and problems he did not foresee. The Golden Boy had appeared on all the night shows, award ceremonies, 
music videos, and dated a list of celebrities that DiCaprio would even admire. Oscar went as far as trying to launch a singing career along the way. Uh, I'll spare you your ears, but go find it on YouTube. But it was not all rose colors for the golden boy. His problems with drugs and alcohol started to wear on the aging fighter. At this time, it was known behind closed doors that the wheels were starting to fall off the wagon. Hopkins was ultimately too much for Oscar at this time in his career. Maybe if he was more disciplined, the fight would have unfolded differently. But the truth was that Hopkins was undefeated for 11 years. He was ranked number one pound for pound by Ring Magazine and was undisputed champion of the middleweight division. The loss would only make the golden boy go into retirement. He would be out the ring 20 months before deciding to come back. This time against Ricardo Mayorga, a reckless individual with faculties for fighting. The fight would be most remembered for Mayorga's pre-fight antics because the fight itself would be a one-sided blowout, winning the WBC light middleweight title. The next fight would be one year later against a fighter who many consider the best of all time, the GOAT. The Golden Boy would be challenged by Floyd Pretty Boy Mayweather. Floyd, obviously due to current relevancy, needs little introduction. But context of his career is also needed for this fight. Because of time and of Floyd's great self-promoting campaigns, the details can sometimes be remembered a little differently. At this point in Floyd's career, he was looking to bring more attention to his career. He was clearly a boxing talent, but his talent was not translating to financial success. Floyd wanted the real big bucks. He was done getting the normal fighter pay. There was a switch that flipped for Mayweather in this fight. His persona changed. He had created a new alter ego for this fight. Floyd, money, Mayweather. This in turn would intensify what would be an unprecedented buildup to what would become the number one pay-per-view of all time. Beating out Iron Mike Tyson for the number one spot. Floyd would take a page from the Mayorga playbook and absolutely belittle Oscar in public. One of Ad was the first installment of the series that would become a beloved series for all big fights held by HBO. Floyd made that series. His smack talking and antics was in stark contrast to Oscar's demeanor. He would never break out of the Golden Boy shell. He always just smile politely and say how he would beat Floyd, only to be mocked by Money Mayweather. What many oversaw was that Floyd was already playing out the game plan to beat Oscar. He knew that with his boxing skills, if he fought the Oscar of the Mallorca fight, he would have an easy night. The overcommitment and blind emotions will leave a fighter open to counter punches of a cool, calm, and collected technician. So by the time they got in the ring, the wound up golden boy was ready to rip Floyd's head off. But he was so blinded by emotions that he did not see the mental trap laid for him. Mayweather though was a master of fighting. To hit and not get hit, to always take the easiest win. He was not here to receive damage or to put on a war, unless that was required. But the layering of the mental game was just an added bonus for him. Even though Oscar at the time was the higher profile athlete, he was not the better fighter. Sure, Oscar was the bigger celebrity than Floyd at the time by many orders of magnitude. Floyd was the B-side when it came to the pay-per-view attraction, let alone overall celebrity. When it came to boxing though, Floyd was the A-side unquestionably. He was rising while De La Hoya was declining. De La Hoya was far from being the fighter who fought Vargas, and even farther from the one who fought Felix Trinidad. By this point in his career, boxing-wise, Oscar was closer to the Chavez he fought in his first fight if Hopkins was the tail end of Oscar's elite level. Then it's obvious that the fight against Floyd three years later is past due. In my opinion, Oscar's prime, when he was in his absolute best form, was the first Chavez fight until the Vargas fight. But again, that's my opinion. Even the fight against Hopkins, I give Oscar a FIFA rating of 85 at best at that point of his career. But when he fought Mayweather, the only thing that was similar between Vargas and the Floyd Oscar was the fame. Floyd, of course, knew this and seized the opportunity. He capitalized on the spotlight and knew this could be a passing of the torch moment for him. It would catapult Floyd into the stratosphere due to his new persona. The skills would always pay the bills. Money Mayweather would ensure that the fans showed up. It was the beginning 
and the end all in one. The start of Floyd Money Mayweather and the absolute end of the Golden Boy. To the boxing community, it was evident that Oscar had no business with an elite fighter in the ring. Oscar would also lose a not so close fight that for some reason many remember as a close fight. Many thought he won in some circles, which is absolutely ludicrous. But this belief and support of fans would continue even after the Mayweather fight. One year later, Oscar would go on to pass the torch again. And yes, I know it happened to Mayweather, but Manny's a bit different. He would not only be stopped again, it would be the moment that many were waiting for the absolute beating of Oscar De La Hoya. Pacquiao was a star already in boxing. He was absolutely destroying other legendary fighters along his way to the top. By the time they fought, Manny had already fought Eric Morales twice, Marc Antonio Barrera twice, two out of four fights with Juan Manuel Marquez, and right before the Oscar fight, he had put David Diaz in a coffin. Pacquiao was a sensation in boxing and had beaten some of the biggest names from Mexico. Larry Merchant is credited for coming up with the idea of what many pictured as David versus Goliath. Pacquiao at the time had to go up two weight classes and Oscar had to come down one weight class to fight at the welterweight limit of 147 pounds. It was a mismatch through and through. To be honest, I don't know why anyone thought it would end up going any other way. Sure, Pacquiao was not the Pac-Man we know today, but Oscar was a shell of his former self. If the FIFA rating for Hopkins was an 85, then in this fight it would be a 75 at best. Oscar was now in place, he had put Chavez in. He was now the old fighter who once was great, getting absolutely battered by the new young champion. Nonetheless, the fight sold 1.5 million pay-per-views, making it only the fourth fight to ever sell over a million pay-per-views without being headlined by a heavyweight fighter, with the other three fights also involving the Golden Boy. He would continue to become one of the biggest attractions of the sport along with Mayweather for the next decade, and that fight against the Pac-Man would be the last fight for the Golden Boy. In my opinion, he should have retired at the Hopkins fight, but the fight against Floyd meant so much for the sport that even that would be okay. But the what ifs don't exist, and of course, if Oscar lived a clean life as an athlete, he might have even done better. Nonetheless, Oscar's career is one for the ages. He might have not gone down as the best to ever do it, but he cracks the top 20. At best, top 15, but mm, maybe not more. Even then, I think that's best case scenario. But one thing is for certain is that as far as Mexican American fighters go, the golden boy, Oscar De La Hoya, is the GOAT. Sing double fist through. Single fist, fist rolling. That would be a little drum cage. 